if I'm hearing that the low mids are a little cloudy every time that vocal's hitting, and I'm trying to focus in on that, first of all, you know, the vocal's coming and going, it's coming and going, and I'm like, listen a minute, it's fatiguing. It's so much easier for me to just hit the solo button and just listen to the voice for a minute and go, oh, okay, it's 2.50. Welcome to Kush After Hours. My name is Gregory Scott. Tonight, I want to talk to you about breaking the rules. A lot of people out there will be talking about how you got to do it this way and you got to do it that way. <laughs> every single mix I do, every single production, breaking the rules. And I find that if I follow the consensus, it just, it hangs me up every time. I can't do it. I got to do it my way, which is exactly the opposite. Number one, Never EQ, never, never in solo. This is crap. It's just total crap. First of all, I think everybody that I know does stuff in solo. Things that you're not supposed to do in solo, absent the context. And I myself generally advise you to not work in solo, especially when you're sort of developing your ear. You got to you got to get the skills together to be able to adjust one thing while everything's coming at you. But that said, there's a time and a place, and especially when you're getting your sea legs, you kind of got to hit the solo because you just can't hear the nuances of what you're doing when everything's cascading around you. And so if you don't do things in solo, you will, especially early on, you will tend to stretch too far and apply more processing than is actually needed just because your ears aren't sensitized enough to the small changes. And what I mean by that is that if you've got a sound here and you got your mix going along and you think it needs a certain boost of a certain frequency, maybe your instinct is completely right. But if your ears aren't sensitive, you'll have to push that EQ up to here to really hear it. Three, four, five, six dB, maybe more. There's nothing wrong with pushing an EQ that far. I just, I just want to say, right? I'm not here to put rules on you as we're talking about breaking the rules. But what I will say is that the older I get, the more experienced I get, the more seasoned I get, my EQs, by and large, are doing very small moves. Now, if I need more EQ, I'll slap another EQ on. And that's a, we'll get to that later. Anyway, I want to focus this conversation here. Sometimes you got to work in solo just to really be able to hear what's going on. What I do in solo generally is clean up EQ. And I do that because, sure, when I've got a full mix going and I got my vocal in there and I just know my radar's ticking and it's like, this vocal is clouding the low mids. I know that very clearly. And if I really work my brain hard, and stop and think about it for a second, I could maybe figure out what the frequencies are. But the thing is, I try to stay a little detached from something like a vocal because I wanna just make sure that I can hear what they're saying and feel the way they're saying it. I try not to get too lost in the technical aspects of the voice. So if I'm hearing that the low mids are a little cloudy every time that vocal's hitting and I'm trying to focus in on that, first of all, you know, the vocal's coming and going, it's coming and going, and I'm like, listen a minute, it's fatiguing. It's so much easier for me to just hit the solo button and just listen to the voice for a minute and go, oh, okay. It's 250, or if it's a female vocal, a lot of times it's 400. It's 400 hertz that's just a little too energized, a little too thick. You lay on compression on a vocal, you lay on some distortion. 400 hertz, my gosh. Everything lives in 400 hertz, right? Pick a sound in your mix. It's got 400 hertz in it. Most of them have a lot of 400 hertz in it. Point is, the female voice... A lot of times when it's clouding up a mix, that's the frequency I will go for. Somewhere around 400, sometimes 500, sometimes 300, 400 for my money. Pulling that down. So then I got a sound in solo. Now here's the thing. Number one, when you're in solo, you don't want to be there for too long because you will acclimate to the skew of the sound that you're listening to. And if you solo the sound because it's skewed too much in one direction and you get used to that one direction, you get used to it a little too cloudy, a little too boxy, a little too muddy or whatever, a little too dull, and then you bring the rest of the mix back in, then you hear everything else is a little too sharp or a little too full or whatever. And you start hunting and finding problems where they didn't exist two minutes ago, but you just spent too long in solo. So by all means, hit the solo button, do what you need to do, Try to get in and out in under a minute. I love the minute rule, right? I will hit the solo button 
And then I'm listening. What I'm listening for is if I've identified that it's 400 hertz on her, maybe it's 250 on him, and I'm pulling it out, and I'm pulling, I'm shaving it out a little bit, and then just pausing and listening, shaving a little more, pausing and listening. And what I want is for if the low mids are just coming at me a little bit in front of the voice from the side, it would look like this. Here's the top of the voice, and here's the bottom. Right? I want it to be even, or maybe even a little bit further back, like that. I want for it to start to just start to sound like maybe possibly it's getting too thin, and then I'm good. Bring the rest of the mix back in. Hit stop. Don't just continue listening. When I come out of solo, for me, if I just keep listening continuously to what I was listening to before and then everything else comes in, my brain is like, stop. So I come out of solo, I will stop. Go to the different part of the song, somewhere else where that element is playing, and then resume. Just a two or a five second break of silence. And then everything comes in all at once. That really helps me to recontextualize and readjust to the reality of the unsoloed mix. And I'll do it sometimes with compression too. If something sounds or feels a little too compressed, I'll solo it out. I'll relax the compression. I'll try to find that spot where I'm like, okay, I've got the density and the urgency that I like, but hmm, I've lost some of the size. If I feel like something is over compressed, I will turn the volume of my mix up. I'll grab my monitor controller and I'll just crank it to 85 dB and I'll be like, mm. And then at that point in time, at low volume, the compression sounds great. You're like, oh, that's so thick and powerful. And then you turn it up and you're like, ah, it's just a wall of noise. So I play my game of averages. I solo out, maybe it's a guitar and I'm doing some squishy compression on guitar. And a lot of times guitars like a lot of squishy compression, but too much. And then the guitar is hitting and it's kind of moving away from me. It's like every time the compressor hits, I can, okay, in solo, I can really hear the nuance of that. I can dial that. Maybe I slow the attack up to let a little bit of that guitar come back through. Or maybe I ease up on the threshold and I let the guitar breathe a little bit more. Or maybe I want the guitar to just kind of sit there and not be moving at all. Stop, unsolo, go somewhere, hit play, resume my life. So there's something that you should know, and that's that most workstation these days have or should have a feature called Solo Dim. I love Solo Dim. Solo Dim adds a whole other dimension to soloing. And what Solo Dim is, for those who don't know, is usually in the preferences you can set how much of a dim you want. I like mine at 20 dB, that's kind of standard. When you hit Solo Dim, what happens is, rather than say you Solo Dim the vocal, usually what happens is solo is, the vocal's there and everything else goes away, right? With solo dim, you hit the vocal and everything else drops down by 20 dB. So there's still a context there. Right? You don't lose complete connection to the mix, to the frequency balances and things like that that you're working with. You can stay somewhat connected to it and be a little bit gently reminded of the universe that you're going to return to when you unsolo. And you said about half the time, the other half of the time, I'm in pure solo. I do process things. I hit that solo button all the time. I try to get in and out quickly. That's that's my rule. So I'm breaking the rule, but I got other rules that I've put in place to kind of put up my safety guards, my, my bumper guards, if you will. And so getting in and out quickly of solo so I don't adjust too much to the solo sound and whatever kind of murk that it's introducing. And I will listen for the nuances. I try to keep grounded in the rest of the mix. I imagine what this is going to sound like in context, or I'll be in solo dim, so I still have some of that context in there. And then I will try to, whatever I'm adjusting, I will try to find that line where it starts to feel like maybe I'm starting to maybe do a little bit too much. I'm starting to cut a little bit too much of the low mids. I'm starting to open up the threshold a little bit too much, putting too much dynamics back in, or taking too many dynamics out. Whatever direction I'm moving in in solo, where I find I'm starting to, mm, I back it off just a little bit. So if I've gone a dB down on an EQ, I'll put a quarter of a dB back. If I've gone three dB down on an EQ, I'll put a half a dB. I'll try to like take 15, 10, 15% of what I just took away and restore it in solo and then put the rest of the mix back in. And that usually, that works pretty well for me. So much for that rule. Don't do things in solo. Rules I break every time I mix. This is part one of three, I believe. I look forward to bringing you the other two. It's possible I've already filmed them. It's the way production works here. Kush after hours, time is meaningless, but the coffee is delicious.